uh, were making progress, a little British influence there, <clears throat> uh, as we will be dealing with Revelation 15 tonight, the shortest chapter in the book of Revelation. And of course, as you know, chapter divisions and verse divisions are artificial. They're not part of the inspired text, but nevertheless, uh, this is the shortest chapter in we are seeing that we're dealing with the tribulation period, which is the longest section in the book of Revelation, cha chapters 4 through 19, which is the bulk of the book of Revelation, the things which shall take place after these things, after the church age is what it's talking about. And so we've noted that there is a heavenly, earthly cycle in Revelation 4 through 20. Uh, and I've... Uh, compared this to the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so God is heavenizing earth, if you will, by judging it. And God decrees something. And then you see uh, the narrative going down to uh, what's happening. And that, what God decreed in heaven, is being fulfilled. Then when that is completed, you go back up to heaven where he decrees more and you see it being fulfilled. So heaven to earth, uh, I believe 11 or 12 times it is. And so here we are in chapter 15 and we see chapter 16 through 18, then back for 19 for the second coming and 19 through 20 for the millennial kingdom. And that then kicks us into later the eternal state. And so this is where we're at. We're making progress, aren't we? Chapter 15, you know, wow, that's pretty good. So the, chapter 15 introduces the series of seven bold judgments. And so we're seeing two chapters. Chapter 14 and 15 are prepping you for the bold judgments, which are the final phase and the previous judgments are partial judgments that God has been pouring out in the seal and trumpet judgments. But the bowl judgments, as depicted by the bowls, are going to be the dumping of God's wrath, as, as we'll see tonight, uh, in preparation for his second coming. And so uh, the series of seven bowl judgments are, are going to be next time we meet and I doubt if we'll get through all of them uh, you know next time we meet but in chapter 16 through uh, verses 1 through 21 and it relates these three brief scenes from heaven each beginning with and I saw or I looked and I think and I saw or and I looked is used uh, 30 something times in the book of Revelation and it is a indicator that he's shifting to something different. He's seeing another vision. He's completing what he was talking about previously, and now he sees another vision that he's reporting on. And this sets the stage for the culminating earthly judgments. So John uses the same technique to prepare for the previous two judgment series, heavenly visions in chapter 4 through 5, prior to the seal judgments. And in 8, 2 through 5, prior to the trumpet judgments. And so John also bridges across a series of intervening visions between the trumpets and the bowls, which are in chapters, we see in chapters 12 through 14, by calling what he sees here another sign in heaven. And that is used elsewhere in 12, 1, and 3. So the structure of three series of uh, sevenfold judgments with interludes that slow down the action but build dramatic tension will finally come to its conclusion in these two chapters, 15 and 16. So, uh, as usual, we're showing you the structure of the text that he's following here as we begin. So the main idea is that seven angels are commissioned to pour out bowls of God's wrath on the earth. I doubt if he took volunteers. Uh, we see that one angel was created and, and he does one thing in all of history. So obviously God has 
millions of angels that he uses, and I don't know if these were created just for this time event or whatever, but nevertheless, there are these seven special angels who are going to be the agents through which God pours out his final wrath on the earth. Uh, while others in heaven celebrate God's justice and holiness expressed in his judgment against evil. We live in a time when God is not directly judging people in the same way that he's going to do it in the book of Revelation, don't we? And we were talking about this before the session tonight, that people think that uh, they're autonomous, that they can do whatever they want, and uh, there's no God they, they convince themselves of this. And we seeing in our own country, which obviously has a great history of Christianity, that people increasingly are moving, especially the leadership of the country, is moving in the direction that uh, God's not out there. We can do whatever we want. And we're going to, ens- us, the elite people, are going to enslave the rest of you peons, whether you like it or not. And that's where we seem to be going in this country as apparently we're preparing for the last days here. And structure-wise, as though postponing something terrible that nevertheless must happen, John takes his chapter to set the, this chapter to set the stage for the final series of judgments that have been anticipated as far back as 10, 6 through 7, and chapter 11, 15 through 19, the seventh trumpet. So recounting the bold judgments themselves will come in chapter 16, but this chapter introduces them in three sections. As in chapter 14, each section is a separate but related vision introduced with and I looked or and I saw. There's the Greek phrase there for those that are interested. Now, verse 1 says, and I saw another sign in heaven and so here's John reporting on the visions that he's seeing now we don't we've talked about this before I don't know if he's seeing uh, like a, a movie preview of things or he's seeing actual events take place but it's something like that he's seeing these things and he's giving a verbal explanation of what he sees under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of course and that's why you have, as we pointed out, over five, at least 550 allusions, words, and phrases that come from the Old Testament. And I want to reiterate again that the book of Revelation takes those scattered prophecies from the Old Testament. Every uh, prophetic book in the Old Testament except for Jonah has future prophecy about what's going to happen in the future, some more than others. And uh, so we see that this is being organized through the words and phrases in the book of Revelation so that when you go and study those Old Testament passages, you have a context, not for all of them, all that's mentioned in those prophecies, but for much of what is mentioned as far as the future goes. So this sign in heaven, great and marvelous. And those are two words and phrases that he's just showing how amazing this is. Great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last. In other words, this is going to be the last phase. I call it the last phase of the bombing campaign. Uh, Because in them, the wrath of God is finished. And... As you probably know from personal interaction, a lot of people just don't like the idea that God has wrath, do do they? He's supposed to be this big fuzzball of love and all of this. Well, we've tried to point out that God is a perfect blend. Some have listed as many as 100 different attributes revealed in Scripture, a perfect blend in a non-contradictory way of all of the attributes, love, wrath, etc., grace, uh, and things. In fact, that could be why God created man, because he couldn't show grace unless you had fallen humanity, you see. These are some aspects that Romans seems to point out 
are some of the reasons why he created man, and history is the way it is. So this is going to finish God's wrath. And 15.1 provides as preview of the coming series of seven judgments or plagues that pour out God's anger in its dreadful finality in chapter 16. So we see in 12.1, where is the other passage where it says a great sign appeared in heaven. And in this case, it was, it was the woman that, rep- does anybody know who the woman represents? Israel. Israel, good, y'all are learning. I'm sure many of you already knew that though. But a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And so it's set in a particular context that we said refers back to uh, the book of Genesis where you have the sun, moon, and stars in, in uh, uh, Joseph's vision, vision there. And here we see the next verse has an and I saw. So this means he's, he's moving on. So he, he sees what we saw in verse 1, and now he's seeing another or a separate vision. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass, as it were, it says. So it's not an actual sea of glass, but it looks like a sea of glass mixed with fire. So, a, you know, and those are kind of contradictory, aren't they? A sea, water, and the polar opposite of water could be fire, you see? So this is, this is amazing. It's a sea, uh, which in Scripture, the sea often represents, uh, you know, a, a multitude of people, the Gentile masses of humanity or something like that. But there's fire. So fire represents judgment. God, God's judgment mixed with fire. And those who had come off victorious from the beast and from his image and, and from the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. And so what you see are believers, all believers in the tribulation, None of them will take the mark of the beast. We saw that in chapter, at the end of chapter 13. And other places it says, we saw the scripture, there's three or four passages in Revelation says, if you take the mark of the beast, then you will spend eternity in the lake of fire. And uh, so obviously that's a, a very determinative decision that people make. And it's still true even in our own day, even though we're not in the tribulation. That's the most important decision you can make is whether or not to trust Christ as your Savior. It's the most important thing because it, it determines your eternal destiny. It determines how you're going to live your life now as well. It, it determines so many. So that's the most important issue for us as fallen humanity is whether or not we're going to trust Christ. And... <clears throat> Here are people who did trust Christ, and they're viewed as victorious. And that's all that's required to be victorious is to be a believer. It's not because they did, you know, 100 push-ups or anything like that, you know, or any particular works. It's because they did not fall for Satan and the deception during the tribulation of the Antichrist. And, and all of that. So that's what makes them victorious. And uh, three things mentioned. The beast, his image. The beast, of course, is Satan. His image, apparently, well, the beast is the Antichrist. But his image that was set up in the temple, you see, is the phony false thing that came to life later. And from the number of his name. In other words, they didn't take the mark. And I think I told you about a song around 1970 some group in San Antonio said don't take the number <laughs> I, should, I should have recorded that and played it for you uh, probably make a lot of people want to leave but nevertheless uh, uh, th- that particular group uh, uh, had a song about the antichrist you know and it has a chorus in it that goes don't take the number <laughs> yeah. uh, but <clears throat> Good advice. Standing on the sea of glass. And so they're standing there, see, as this graphic tries to depict. See, the, it's a sea of glass. So it means it's clear like crystal. But there's also the fire 
element that that's, this graphic is trying to depict, which we don't know if that's the way it's going to be, but that's a good guess, I guess. Holding harps of God. Now, harps, uh, I don't know what the Church of Christ do with this, but nevertheless, <laughs> are others that believe you shouldn't, even John Calvin was opposed to uh, musical, he said, he said, he, Calvin said, he did not mind musical instruments in a worship service as long as they're neither seen nor heard. <laughs> and uh, I heard a Church of Christ guy quote that once. It, it stuck with me. It's not very often that they quote John Calvin, but nevertheless, <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, they are playing musical instruments. And so this is the idea of victory here. That each is, pl- I guess they're going to intuitively know how to play a harp. I don't know about you, but you know I can't play on the linoleum without getting a cold. But nevertheless, some of these people uh, <laughs> were going to be playing harps. So the second heavenly scene that John records in verses two through four, in preparation for the bowl judgments that begin here, with his second, and I saw in the chapter. So the sea of glass mixed with. Fire is likely represents God's glory and holiness, uh, same as pictured in 4, 6 to 7. So his glory and his holiness, and that's what I'm saying. You can't pit one attribute of God against another like a lot of people try to do. Uh, God is who he is, perfectly balanced. I hate to use that word balanced but he's perfectly the perfect mix of all those attributes uh, without contradiction. There's no conflict within his personality with any of his characteristics. So the victorious overcomers are first from the beast, as 13.1 says, the beast coming up out of the sea. They're victorious over the beast, the Antichrist. And secondly, from his image... Uh, 13, 14, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. And so uh, they're victorious over that. They did not participate in that image of the beast. And thirdly, from the number of his name, that's 666. Don't take the number. (coughs) Uh, Calculate the number of the beast. And so this is what they're victorious over. They didn't fall for false doctrine. We, we have the same kind of stuff going on today, in a sense, in that we can fall for false doctrine, can't we? For false things. And that's why you have to know and put into practice the Word of God. It will keep you safe. So, it says in verse 3, And they sang the song of Moses the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So the song of Moses, of course, is the victorious song that was his sister, song of Deborah. Deborah, no, what was it? Miriam. Miriam, thank you. Uh, sang after, you know, the horse and rider thrown into the sea, you know, after deliverance from the Egyptians. And uh, they apparently wrote a song, and of the Lamb. So we're seeing a here a comparison between those two, because what is similar, the fact that they have been defeated from a great, uh, they have been saved from a great enemy, and so uh, they are singing a song of victory and praise to God here. So, which is a song of deliverance or salvation, as I've already said. And so, the song of Moses and the Lamb, the victors in heaven at the end of time sing a song of praise to God for his mighty acts of justice and faithfulness to his people in judging the godless empires who oppose them. Their song and God's faithfulness and justice thus celebrated will follow the same pattern as the song that Israel sang under Moses after their deliverance from Egypt. You got a whole chapter here almost of a pretty long song. And music in the Bible 
and I, I don't like these songs that go, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, you know, that repeat stuff over and over. To me, that is similar to pagan, vain repetition. And a lot of times, it's used to put people into certain moods and stuff. Obviously, holy, holy, holy has three holies in there for each person of the Trinity. But, so there's meaning. But in the Bible, all praise gives a specific reason for praise. God did this, he did that, etc. And it's, it's not just thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus type music. That to me uh, reflects pagan influence of trying to work people up into uh, some psychological state uh, which is characteristic of pagan religion. Because God's faithful deliverance will follow the same glorious and invincible pattern. God used his faithful servant Moses to accomplish an astounding deliverance from Israel bondage to Pharaoh in Egypt. Don't forget, Egypt was so powerful and no one other than God himself ever defeated the Egyptians. No one ever successfully rebelled against Egypt. Only God. <laughs> but that's good enough. But even greater will be God's judgment and victory through the lamb over the beast and all the nations under his sway. And so you see, in a sense, a regional victory, but here at the end of history, it's going to be what? A global victory. Because the whole world uh, system has become Egypt all over again. And so God's deliverance is going to come. And so this is what they say, saying... In other words, singing. Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord. The Almighty, righteous and true are thy ways. Thou King of the nations. And so here's, as we say, specific reasons being given of praise in their music here by, uh, to the Lord. And so all of these saved people from all the nations. And by the way, I think this is at the end of history, at the end of the tribulation, rather. But it's being presented before the final judgment, showing the certainty. You, you have this in the book of Revelation. Before something happens, it's presented as a sure thing. And this is what we're seeing here in this chapter, that this is praise that's going to happen that has in, in the chronology of history has not yet happened, but it's going to happen. And so you're seeing that before it actually takes place because the judgments are going to take place in the next chapter, followed then by the judgment of Babylon in chapter 17 and 18. Babylon represents the, wor the world system. It's where corporate rebellion began after the flood. And Babylon is the, op is the opponent historically of Jerusalem of Israel, of God. And so then you have the second coming in chapter 19 resulting in the millennium in chapter 20, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, followed by the eternal state. So you can see the sequential development in the book of Revelation with pauses to deal topically with certain subjects and issues. And so... Uh, the idea of great and marvelous, marvelous, you know, means just amazing. Uh, and the Lord God, the Almighty, or some of his, beginning to name some of his attributes or characteristics. Almighty means that there's nobody that can mess with him when he wants to uh, apply himself in this way and as I mentioned a number of times how does God end it all with the breath of his mouth and he blows away all the bad guys at the end of history he doesn't even break a sweat so to speak and righteous and true are thy ways so righteousness has to do with a standard, the term righteousness and justice, righteousness has to do with having the right standard. You follow what I'm saying? 
justice has to do with the application of the right standard. So you often see those together. But here it's righteousness saying that God, what God's standards are right. There is no way you can argue against that. And they're true, truthful. In other words, this is not a facade. This is not an illusion. It is something that is, is, represents actual reality. You know, it's not a drug trip. It, it is reality. And a lot of people are going to have to wake up uh, those who oppose the Lord at this time in history are going to be awoken. Uh, who was it? Was it Kant that said he, no, or was it Kierkegaard? I can't remember. He's awoken from his dogmatic slumber or something. I think it was Kierkegaard about Kant. Yeah. Well, they're going to be woken up unbelievers in a, in a different way here. Uh, so verse 4 says, Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name? And I, I assume this is talking about among the assembly of the believers here. But unbelievers are going to come, we know from Philippians 2, and recognize that God is, but I don't think they're ever going to, because of their fallen sinful natures, even in hell, are going to worship God and say, boy, I missed an opportunity. Uh, so, for thou alone art holy. Holy means to be set apart. And the word holiness, uh, just have to see what time it is. I can't see. Uh, means to set apart something. For example, uh, my wife, when we got married, she got her everyday dishes and then her special china for special occasions and so that china and stuff that she would use for holidays and sundays and things like that was different from the dishes and plates that we used every day and so the idea of non-holiness in the bible is co common something that's common holy in the bible is something that's set apart it's not just something that's mysterious and ghost-like or anything. It has nothing to do with it. And so to be holy means to be set apart. And, of course, obviously in the context of the Bible, that means set apart to the Lord. You see Samuel was set apart. You see examples of this. The temple was holy or set apart, and only certain priests who were set apart could go in it one day a year, you see, into the Holy of Holies. And so, so that's the idea. Uh, he alone is holy, for all the nations will come and worship before thee. And this is why there are going to be redeemed people from every tribe, country, tongue, or nation. That term is used seven times in the book of Revelation. The smallest people group is going to have, uh, I'm sure, more than one person from each of those. And that, so that's why you start out in the Bible with a few getting saved, eight souls at the flood, and history builds, and by the end, you have this huge revival, which is not a majority, however, apparently, uh, in my opinion, but it's still a huge number, vastly uh, around from every tribe, country, tongue, or nation, so that Israel is the priestly nation that was supposed to evangelize the world, and that's exactly what they're going to do during the trip. And the church because of Israel's failure, we've been doing that during this time. Well, come and worship before thee, for thy righteous acts have been revealed. And once again, righteousness has to do with imp the implementation of something that's just or right. And so God, here, righteousness is emphasized. The fact that God has worked or acted in history in a righteous way that, that is proper. And as a result, people are going to praise him for these things. And th this is something, as I've been talking about tonight, good to keep in mind when you pray 
and praise God is think of specific things that he's done in your life and in the life of the church or the community or groups of people and stuff like this uh, because that is what's going to be memorialized for all of history. Other passages teach that the works of man are going to be forgotten. Uh, you know, I can't help but, you know, growing up listening to the top 40 music, and oh, this song is going to be famous forever. You know, the Beatles or somebody, you know. I'm sorry there's going to come a time when nobody's going to even remember those folks. It's only what's done for Christ that lasts. So three praises to God. The Lord alone is holy, highlighting his uniqueness and perfection above all other creatures or supposed gods. He alone deserves the ultimate devotion and reverence of all humanity. Secondly, the prophetic anticipation that one day all the nations will come and worship the Lord. This turning of the nations to the true God will be the positive outcome of the Lord's defeat of evil and its dominion over the world of humanity. And thirdly, the song proclaims that the Lord's righteous acts have been made evident. They're on display. What heaven knows of God's just and faithful character will soon be displayed on earth for all to see. And so we don't see that today on earth, do we? Being recognized by the peoples and the nations. But there's coming a time when unbelievers will be removed and this will be the focus of history. And in verse 5 it says, after these things, so here's the third shift, uh, I looked. So he's, once again, John is not simply writing down his thoughts, but he's seeing these visions and he is writing down what he sees. So he's not free to think whatever he thinks. He is recording the visions of future history. Just think of that, however that works. And the temple, the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And so this is what, where God is presented in the Bible as dwelling. And even in Israel, as we've already talked about tonight, God dwelt among his people in his temple. And you see in the Old Testament, when, when they were moving and they would set up, they would put the, temp, the tabernacle in the middle right, and they'd have tw uh, three tribes on the north, three tribes on the east, three tribes on the south, three tribes on the west. And it talks about God inhabiting the praises of his people. Now, that's a, that's a misused verse today. Uh, you know, some song leader gets up in a church and says, God inhabits the praises of his people. And so if we praise God, you know, God's presence will be here. Has anybody ever heard that? <laughs> I have. But that passage that often is referred to is talking about in the context of Israel uh, as a nation with God, with the tabernacle in the middle and God dwelling via the Shekinah glory in the middle, you see, in dwelling his people, taking care of his people, protecting his people, you see, watching over his people. And so this is, this is the thing. And the, there is a, another tabernacle or the the tabernacle or temple in heaven and it was believed and it says this in Hebrews that the t temple or tabernacle that they made on planet earth was a replica of the one in heaven right and so that and the purpose for a tabernacle or temple is the same thing we have today in what are called clean rooms in chip making you can't have one speck of dust in a chip making room or anything and so they dress up and they have totally sanitized rooms in order to make chips well the earth is viewed in the bible as polluted because of sin and so god creates a clean room a place which is the tabernacle of the temple the holy of holies 
where man can meet God, but you have to jump through all of these hoops, you see, uh, in order to approach God. And it's showing how holy he is and how he's, in that sense, morally, he's se separated and apart from his creation in that way. And so this tabernacle is a place where you would meet God in a dirty environment called planet Earth. And uh, so this is the actual heavenly one. We see in 1119 of Revelation, it says, And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened. And the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and pearls of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. hailstorm. And so you see that this is showing the, the fiercest greatness and holiness of God being displayed when they open that, that uh, tabernacle there. And the, we've already looked at that verse. So the vision now records the equipping and heavenly author, authorization of the seven angels for the work of judgment they carry out in 16, 1 through 21. These angels dressed impressively like emissaries of God represent God's authorization to act. Previously, the heavenly temple is opened, as we just saw, and in both places it represents the ominous appearance of God himself, ready to exact his judgment upon rebellious humanity. So because the heavenly temple is a prototype of the earthly tabernacle, and later Jerusalem's temple, according to Hebrews 8, 5, it can be described as the tabernacle of testimony. It bears witness to the Lord's presence in heaven just as he was among his people, Israel, in the wilderness of Jerusalem, as I've already talked about. And so this is where all of this stuff is coming from, from the throne of God. And here's Hebrews 8, 4 through 5, which says, Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, talking about Christ, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. See, so there it's talking about that. Just as Moses was warned by God when, the, when he was about to erect the tabernacles, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. You know, on Revelation. So this is a the earthly temple and tabernacle is a pattern of one that exists in heaven where God actually functions and rules and reigns. And verse 6 says, And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their breasts with golden girdles. And so here, here they're coming, and uh, they are have bowls, because God's going to dump all judgment on this. And so these seven angels, there's no girl angels, by the way, but this was the best picture available. Sorry. And uh, so the golden girdles are sashes with which the angels were girded or pos uh, po positioned the same way as we saw of Christ in 118 and apparently carrying the symbolism. Uh, the, they mark those who are on a mission to inflict God's judgment. So that's why Christ has a golden sash in chapter 1, and they, carrying these bowls of wrath, have that same gold sash because they're about to be agents of judgment on planet Earth here. And we see in verse 7, And one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So remember, early in Genesis, chapters 4 and 5, we see four living creatures around the throne. And so one of those four living creatures, and these are angels that are the closest to God. And, you know, they say, holy, 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 and all of that uh, constantly. So w one of them gives out these seven bowls containing the wrath of God that are going to be implemented in the next chapter of the book of Revelation. And so this is coming straight from God, uh, the wrath. And the bowls in 5.8 were full of incense, the prayers of the saints. Uh, and later on in the book of Revelation, 
he tells them to sit, I, I like to use the phrase, sit down, take a number, I'll get to you guys later. So now, where he, where he, he didn't answer their prayers, he's now getting, because they ask, how long, O Lord, holy and just, will thou not avenge the blood of, against those who dwell on the earth? The earth dwells. When, you, when are you going to avenge us? And that's where he says, sit down, take a number, I'll get to you guys later. He doesn't actually say that, but you know, uh, a little free lance there. And now they're getting ready to pour those bowls of wrath, those prayers. They're called imprecatory prayers, prayers of judgment, that have been suspended, I think, during the church age because God still holds out hope for people coming to faith in Christ. But now that judgment is here, he's going to dump them out. And these are the prayers of the saints with the judgment of God. So they portray dreadful events ahead of the, for the earth. <clears throat> the term kylos, phylos, uh, designates shadow, shallow bowls or saucers. The bowls are full to the brim with the hot anger of God. The fullness speaks of the devastating character as well as the finality of the coming divine judgment. So it's not going to be partial. It's not going to be one-third, 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 as we've seen earlier, but it's the full wrath of God being poured out. And the final verse says, The temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. So you see this, for example, when Solomon uh, finished building the temple the night before he's in there. And that's where that passage, if my people call my name, humble myself and pray and say, it's not referring to America, and you cannot apply it to America. I'm sorry. Because in the context, in, in two or three chapter sequence, my people are like 11 times called Israel. In the context of my people are called by my name, uh, and it's right before the temple's being dedicated. And that passage is quoted there, and then the glory gets so heavy that Solomon has to leave the temple because the Shekinah glory came and filled the temple. So it's a repeat of the same thing. The temple was filled with the smoke. In other words, the glory from the glory of God and from his uh, power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. And so they're not able to go and be in that temple at that time. And God is angry. So he's shutting everything down to focus on his judgment. And so that's what, what the final verse of this chapter. So with the bowl in the hands of the angels, the heavenly temple undergoes an awe-inspiring transformation into an environment accessible only to God. God is unapproachable when he is immediately present and working in this way. Once God's patience has finally ended, nothing can interrupt the outpouring of God's wrath. So it's been 2,000 years in the church age almost. I think we're nine years away from 2,000 years or something like that. And so we say, how long, O Lord, will thou not avenge the blood of those who dwell on the earth? In other words, it's time to come. It's kind of how this chapter closes and then the next chapter we'll see next time we meet will be the actual implementation or execution of the judgments that spent two chapters building up and getting ready for let's pray father we thank you so much that you're the type of god that you are you're faithful and just you're loving you're omniscient you're omnipotent omnipresent and many more characteristics. And we thank you that you have been gracious to believers and called us to yourself. And I pray that in the midst of what doesn't appear to be working out according to Scripture, that we, would, we realize that your Scripture has always been fulfilled whenever prophecy is given for a particular time. And we know that you will bring these events to pass in the future. So we pray that that would motivate us to serve you in the present, to preach the word of God, 
and to long for your return. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Any quick burning question before we quit? Yes. Yeah, uh, because this is it. Good, good, that's a good observation that there's two chapters of, pre- of preparation for these bowl judgments. And they're, they're just extremely severe. Do we ever see God's wrath like this again from what we've studied in Scripture? Well, uh, Well, not in a drawn-out way. We see at the end of the millennium yes. where he just bangs, yes. you know, speaks a word and, and that. And then, of course, there's eternal judgment for unbelievers who, who are, I use the illustration, in the county jail, which is a lot like the penitentiary, but they're not put in the penitentiary till the end of history, you see. So... Uh, as we see from Luke 16 and the rich man and Lazarus, etc. Any other questions or comments? Well, you're dismissed. So two minutes after, according to that clock. <laughs>